Thanks for joining our meeting today, our Zoom meeting. I love our chats. Um, this is an open forum where we're going to chat and just talk about today's topic that says it's easy to stay safe online. And maybe I should have put a question mark behind that because is it? So th there's nothing more scary than you getting a notice from the social media account or a hospital or worse, your bank that says that your information, quote unquote, may have been compromised. And we know that many of you serve, um, you know, organizations that are vulnerable, um, like victims of domestic violence, senior citizen youth, and the list goes on on everybody that you serve. Um, I know you value their privacy. Today, our guest speaker is going to share how you can make sure that you and your organization is safe online. So I want you to be a part of the conversation as well and share what you're doing or maybe you're not doing anything and you needed this information today. I'm Aretha Simons. I'm the webinar producer here at TechSoup. If this is your first time joining us, I just want to let you know that since this is a Zoom meeting, um, feel free to be on camera or off camera, but please keep your microphones on mute unless you are ready to speak after the speaker. Use the raise your hand option at the bottom of the screen. Also, we are recording this, so you'll get the recording within 48 hours. And I'm going to move out of the way and introduce our guest speaker today. Um, Michael Enos. Michael wears a lot of hats. Today, he's going to be our cybersecurity person because he specializes in that and knows a lot about that. So, Michael, thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you. This is a great privilege. I love doing uh, presentations for the community. Um, you know, just a little bit about me and my background. I've been in the uh, social, the civil, civil society sector. Uh, since graduating from college uh, at, at Santa Cruz in, at UCSC and um, went on to get my MBA at Santa Clara. And uh, so, um, and, you know, began working, you know, as, as first as a social worker for, for, a, um, for a nonprofit that worked with uh, develop, developmentally disabled adults, helping them uh, live more independent lives in the community. And it was there that I learned uh, that there was a real need and, and a gap with uh, technology in the sector. And so I went into, uh, I became the technology manager, which we didn't have and uh, and have been doing that since. After uh, my second uh, role was uh, as the CIO for Second Harvest Food Bank of Silicon Valley, where I was in that position for over a decade. And, um, you know, essentially, which is in this, that food bank in California is one of the largest in the country. And, uh, and I learned a lot about data and keeping data safe. I mean, we, um, it was super important, uh, you know, and in that, I sort of learned that, you know, uh, civil society is critical infrastructure. I mean, the organizations, nonprofits, and NGOs worldwide are part of our critical infrastructure. And as such, it is super important that we keep the data of our constituents safe. Our constituents will include people like, you know, donors and the, some of the most vulnerable populations in the world. So I'm going to get into that a little bit. Um, I mean, to go over today's topics, first I wanted to give sort of an overview of cybersecurity frameworks, which is essentially... Um, and this is important, especially for people in leadership to understand that, you know, us in, in you know, at TechSoup, my role is, I've been with TechSoup for eight years, and my role at TechSoup, I do wear a lot of hats. I oversee our enterprise infrastructure. We have platforms globally. Um, and I also oversee um, some software development teams. And I also oversee our cybersecurity program and our in, in, InfoSec program. And so... When people ask me, you know, where do you get guidance? You know, where did you learn this stuff? Or, you know, where can I get information about, how, you know, how this all works? Um, we do, you know, use frameworks, um, you know, that are that are specified um, and industry best standards. And we that's our guidance. That's like the ruler by which we measure our, ourselves. By. Um, and that's what gives us guidance. So it's not like Michael says we need to do this or this. It's, it's like, oh, this is what the framework says. I'm here to help implement it and deploy this in the organization. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the sort of some easy, four easy sort of 
things that could instant, like that really could be, should be priorities for an organization in terms of um, being safe online. And this is, so this is, you know, cybersecurity is a big topic. And today we're going to be kind of focusing and narrowing in on, um, you know, not being so much like, you know, you know, stuff like um, security forensics or, or things that are really deeply technical. These are things that users can do to, to help them be safer online. And it's important because these are the sort of the essentials and they, they apply not just to your organization, but also just the practices that you employ because with more and more people working remote, you know, you're using the same device to, to go to your bank account and, you know, then as you are to probably go online to, to, to work with your constituents' information and data in some software as a service tool. Um, you know, online fundraising tool or platform marketing platform or client services um, program. You know, so it, you know, so these things are important because this keeps you safe online and what you do online affects everything else that you're doing online. So if you're doing a lot of engagement with your community or constituents and, and working with our data, it's um, the safety there. Uh, is it should be you know can be applied everywhere. So, um, so those four topics: multi-factor authentication, uh, privileged access, and password management. Um, they, they are sort of two different things, but they're very much related. And so I'm going to talk about them sort of together. Um, the importance of keeping systems up to date. Um, that's critical. And then also I'm going to talk about security awareness training, which is something that's very important to understand. You know what you know, how, how do we say So this is, in some ways, this is almost like a security, basic security awareness one-on-one. Um, so why is it that, um, you know, the, the types of cyber threats that NGOs face, and this is why it's important to be, be safe, because um, if we're not safe online, um, being safe online is one of the ways we can mitigate some of the cyber threats that we see. Um, you know, in, you know, that are, you know, as, as targets, you know, we, some of our organizations can potentially be targets, uh, for, you know, somebody who is looking for valuable data, if they're looking to, um, just, you know, cause disruption. Um, and, and, and in some cases it's more, it's more serious. It's targeted because there's something that they don't like about your organization. So, um, and the things that can happen as a result of that is, you know, you can not only have a, you know, disruption in, in you know, your mission, um, but, you know, worse, you could have, you know, a data breach and then have to deal with reputation and other factors. Um, and so these are some of the broad sort of areas that we, you know, oftentimes to talk about. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, it's important that we protect our data and, and are safe online because, you know, we do, we're working with financial information, uh, donor data, data, and some of the, you know, population's vulnerable personal information. So this is why it's critical that we sort of, you know, kind of keep this as a priority and a focus with an organization, especially as more and more um, activity and cyber, it's easier and easier, so it's easier and easier for people to conduct cyber the terrorism essentially the tools are you know ubiquitous uh, they're they're cheap and anybody can you know go off and want to you know uh, hack something in order to uh, turn it into a crypto mining operation or to try to find if there's some valuable information or data or something that they could then sell like a username and password or some bank account information and so there's Robot, there's bots that go across the internet and just scan things. And what they're scanning for, um, I'll go into a little bit because that's why it is, that's why it's really important to stay on safe online because um, these, you know, it's like, it's sort of, you don't see them, they're sort of invisible, but they're out there. And we track that stuff at TechSoup. In our 100 platforms uh, that we monitor, we have thousands and thousands. I mean, hundreds of thousands of events every single day, people, you know, hit, hitting our stuff, trying to say, hey, is there a crack here? Is there a crack there? Trying to find that weak link that they could then leverage in. Um, and we have, at TechSoup, we have very sophisticated tooling 
Um, but that's a topic for another day. What this is about is really about, you know, staying safe online. So I'm going to jump in. We're going to talk a little bit about, and after each one of these, I'll open it up for questions so that we can, you know, I can answer questions as we go along. There'll be a time at the end, but I want to make sure that as I'm moving through, I don't want to just be talking ahead here. So, you know, it's, um, it's important that we have this be a discussion. Um, so, a tech soup and, and many organizations uh, use a framework called NIST. Um, it's the NIST Cybersecurity Framework. Um, uh, NIST stands for the National Institute of Security um, uh, Standards and Technology. And, you know, they put together this framework. And uh, what's important about the framework is they kind of, it provides uh, an organization with a, a basic, you know, co concepts for how to then practice cybersecurity safety, not just you know, be staying safe online, the folks of this organization, of, of this top of this of webinar, but also other things like what kind of policies should you have in place? You know, what do you do in case of a security incident? Um, how do you make sure your data is backed up and, and, and stored? What's, how is the safe way to do that? And it provides policy um, guidelines. And so we use this and there's some, these, these I'm gonna quickly go over these um, five areas. Because then, because what we are going to, because each one of the things we're going to talk about in terms of data safety actually are connected to, to, to these different um, kind of governing principles. Um, and these are things that, like I said, we're not going to go into the details on every single one. Um, but, I, you know, when I do topic, when I do presentations, sometimes I'll just focus on one of these, like data, like resiliency, you know, business resiliency. I talk about more on the you know, identify and recover aspect of it. And then other times it's, you know, going to be on, on response. Um, but essentially, these basic principles sort of outline a framework by which to think about. And so um, we're going to provide, you know, there's going to be links to this available. And so, you know, in your spare time, which we all have plenty of, um, it's important, you know, it, you know, take a look at this and, and think to yourself, where do we have you know, potential gaps in, in our organization, the way we think about cybersecurity. Um, you know, so for example, maybe you, you know, you have people working with very sensitive data and, and they have, you know, like for example, financial information. Um, you know, are you doing background checks, you know, but when they're hired? Um, I'm going to talk about, and one of the things I'm going to talk about later is requiring individual user accounts for each employee. That's, what I call uh, basically a privilege access management. Um, so, you know, and then we have, you know, this, the whole section of this is sort of dedicated to business resiliency, you know, so, you know, how do you essentially protect your systems and ensure that there's data being backed up, that you've tested, that the data works that's been backed up. Uh, that's oftentimes something that gets, is a big gotcha. It's like, oh, we thought we were backing up our systems and, um, and but nobody had really checked. Um, and part of this is, um, and then the other thing is, you know, which is very important, number four is something we, you know, kind of really try to impress upon our community to, you know, think about is, is the last thing you want to be doing if a security incident happens is to then have to come up like, what do I do? You know, how do I, how do I respond to this? How do I respond to my community? How do I get the right people in the room to, to talk? And in also, and then how do I communicate this, you know, you know, to the public? Is this going to be a, you know, a marketing nightmare? And so, you know, what's important is to have a plan in place. And also just to remember that transparency is always going to be your friend when it comes to this. There's one of the mistakes that some organizations do is they try to push something underneath the rug if there's been a cybersecurity incident. And that's the exact opposite of what you do. It should be fully transparent. Because that will help ensure that your trust maintains with your community. They'll say, well, it's not, you know, this happens to everybody. And so it's how you respond. And you kind of know that in the sector because it's, you know, it's, you know, things happen in the world. And we have to be realistic about them and professional about them and maintain that sort of accountability. And oftentimes, organiz you know, civil society organizations are have to be more accountable than even private sector organizations. You know, we have to submit our financial information to IRS. 
Um, and if there's a data breach, it's very important that we let our constituents know and, and also see the effect of what that is. Um, and then, of course, we need to ensure that there's ways to detect, you know, um, things like, you know, you know, using ants that's better, you know, making sure you have up-to-date antivirus, um, that you're monitoring systems, um, and that you have some way to be able to detect something. And then, um, well, I kind of went out of order here, but uh, protect is, is uh, some of the stuff that we're actually going to be focusing on today, essentially, such as patching your systems, um, being ensuring that you have, you know, you know, systems. Some of these things I'm not going to go into like encryption. I could do an entire, you know, webinar on. But, I, but that's why I'm providing this because this is, you know, I'm because I'm focusing most of the presentation on just online safety. I will, I always want to present sort of like the big picture and then say, okay, now we're going to talk about a particular aspect of this. So, um, so that's it. you know, I'm going to pause there and ask. If anybody has any questions about cybersecurity frameworks. So there's a question from Lenore. Did you want to ask him or did you want me to read your question? I like it when you guys ask because it's in your voice. I may say it wrong. So would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Oh, she said reads, please. Okay. Uh, do you have a draft language that can be shared to add to the website uh, privacy, privacy policy to ensure that communication that this is communicated within the policy, excuse me. So you know what? Um, so the at the end of this, there's going to be a link to an organization called SANS.org. So if you go to SANS.org, or if you go to SANS.org, um, poli cybersecurity policy templates, um, and read them, maybe you could type that into the chat um, because that if you if you put that in a search Google search or you know whatever browser you use. You'll you'll see that the, the all the, the that organization sans.org provides templates for everything you would want um, in terms of uh, for inf information security and privacy protection, and that's what that's that's you know usually where I point people if they're asking, do you have a template for this? I mean, because if we said you are, you would just have it's that's what we did, you know, essentially. I mean, you also have to kind of custom modify it to your own purpose. I hope that helps. And are you saying SAN, S A N, or S A M? S A N, as in Nancy. Great. It's, uh, this, That's yeah, what I put. S A N S. Okay. Therapy. Yep, that's it. Yeah, and at the end, there's going to be a link to some other resources too that are, you know, it'd be good to, to, to review as well. Um. Okay, so moving on, unless there's other questions. No, no other questions at this time. Great. Okay, well, I'm going to dig right in and, and then talk about multi-factor uh, authentication. Now, I know that there's a couple different words for this. Sometimes people say it's two-factor authentication. Um, essentially, the way that I like to describe this is you know, to use the simple ana analogy of what everybody does when they go to a Assuming you have a car and you go to a gas station, or you have an ATM and you go somewhere um, to, to, to get a cash out. Essentially, you may not know, but you're actually using multi-factor authentication when you when you when you do those things. Uh, because what the factor is, what what the reason why it's called multi-factor is that a factor is two different types of data points. Like for example, it's something that you know and then something that you have. So it's not just, you know, two things that you know, you know, like, um, you know, what's your password and what's your, you know, mother's maiden name, you know, that's, those are two things, you know, but it's not something that you actually have. And so uh, the reason why multi-factor authentication is, is, is important is because it's, it's sort of a, it, there's a check and balance there. So you actually have to have something physical with you. So, like when you go to a gas station, you actually put, physically put your card in. Um, so that's something you have, but then it asks you for your zip code um, or some other piece of information. At least it should, or or it's reading your you know your chip. Um, but if you go to a bank to go get a you know cash out, it'll ask for you know um, you have your card with you. You put the card in, but then it asks for your password. Um, and so those are two different factors. And so 
enabling this more and more. Um, I mean, almost every place you, you, you go online now has the ability to um, set up um, multi-factor factor authentication. In fact, many times you don't have a choice. Um, and this is super important because uh, if, you know, there's, you know, our email address, for example, is, is almost, unfortunately, it's almost, you know, public information. And a lot of sites are scraped for information about, you know, our, our data. And, and so, and when a security breach happens, so for example, when, you know, this, I'm not going to name a company, but, you know, when a famous company was, you know, like that social media platform was was hacked or, or its data stolen. Uh, you know, they they have access to your your username and and maybe a hashed password, and they can maybe un unencrypt that password. But they may actually have a, that password. And so um, we're going to talk about password management uh, a little bit later. But the reason why multi-factor authentication is, is 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 important because even if they just have your username, they go, oh look. You know, I'm going to try to brute force a system by hammering it with every single permutation um, of this person's name, uh, what their, you know, that they know your birth date, you know, what their, you know, things, things that they may think, and, and it's automatic, and they have these things that will run very, very quickly. Um, and some systems don't have rate limiting protection, and so they'll allow something just to randomly hit it thousands of times a second to, to try different username password combinations. And then at some point they just let that run, and at some point it could uh, it could crack, you know. And then and then then find that. And, and I, you know, by the way, I don't mean to scare anybody today. I mean, it's some of this. It's kind of a scary topic, but uh, <laughs> um, but it, this is why we're teaching this, you know. If it wasn't, you know, if it wasn't important. To, there would, you know, if it wasn't kind of scary, there wouldn't be a reason for me to be up here, you know, uh, blabbering away at you all. So um, so some of the things here that they talk about is, you know. You know some important. Um, that, you know some of the things that are are mentioned. You know are are super like these are super good guidelines. You know, um, the you know a you know one of the you know there's different ways that we could use um, multi-factor authentication. Oftentimes it's with your phone, which is good with an SMS text. You know, so you get a text and then you you type in a code on your. I think we've all done that right now. Um, but there's also more sophisticated ways, such as using an authenticator app, which, you know, Google makes one, uh, Microsoft makes one, um, and there's other versions. But the authenticator app is a little bit better because it's not going over the, you know, and the way that works is that it's it randomly generates codes. And, and what you do is you go to open up your authenticator app and you type in that code that's on the app. And the reason why that's a little bit better than just using your phone is because SMS is still wireless technology and it's still tra being transmitted. And there's uh, some people have been starting to figure out ways to sort of hack those systems that then actually you know, generate those SMS text messages. And if they can do that, then they can get hold of the codes that are being generated and sent to you. Um, whereas with the authenticator apps, those are randomly generated. Um, and they, they, they match the certain types of codes that, that are used by the software program. Um, and then they're updated, not, not, at, not in real time, but they're updated in some frequency. Um, no, uh, the authenticator apps are free. So you can, if you go to uh, Google Play, now not, not all systems support it, but, but for example, if you use uh, Google G Suite for your organization uh, or if you use uh, Microsoft M365, um, it, besides, you know, when you set up the security and M MFA in both of those systems, then you could essentially have the option to use an authenticator app instead. And it's oftentimes what they do is they have a QR code. You, you point your phone to the QR code that um, that's provided by you know Google or Microsoft, and then it, it says, okay, and now you're you're connected. Your authenticator app is connected to us. Um, it's really pretty easy, you know, set up. So it doesn't cost anything. Um, good question, though. Um, so, and the other thing is that if you have, but uh, we use, you know, the people at TechSupport who are in, um, you know, who have access to privileged systems use something called a YubiKey. Um, and I'm going to show what this is. Um, 
I don't know if you've seen these. People have these things. Uh, try to get it in focus here. There we go. And this is this is a hardware device, and this plugs into my USB port. And so what happens is is that when I'm using certain systems that allow for this, at some point it'll prompt me and it'll say, um, you know, insert your insert your security key. And I just touch this, and it says, oh, you know, that because this key is registered. There's special information on this key that's registered with that software company. This is the, pretty much the safest way you know, <laughs> to do things. But and these are we don't have a unfortunately we don't have a program with TechSoup yet that that offers, but they're not that much. This is maybe a thirty dollar device. Um, maybe they they range, but you know you give me like from say thirty to sixty dollar. You know these these keys. Um, and so. These are that you know the other thing is oftentimes your phone will have a you know biometric thing that will you know face recognition and that that works you know as well. So, uh, so basically, if you if your key gets uh, uh, if it gets replaced, how can the information be accessed? Oh, it gets misplaced. You know what's what's interesting is that um, you can generally have a backdoor with you know um, because other than you you probably have something called you know something like that. So in order to access the system and then be able to set it on there. Um, for us who are managing you know these full blown platforms, we we have to have access. So there's two blocks available. There's a UB. Uh, Y U D I. Um, oh, thank you for that. You know, when I had moved my phone, is that probably better with the audio? Apologies. Thank you. Um, I do want to mention the closed caption is on. So yeah, thank you guys for mentioning that. If if um if you can't hear him or or. The closed captions on. Just type on the CC at the bottom of your screen. So go ahead, Mike. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Okay. So, um, all right. Uh, so moving on. Any any other questions about multi-factor uh, authentication? You know, can this key be used with QuickBooks? You know, I've never explored that. Um, we don't use QuickBooks. Um, but that's a good question, and I imagine that if you uh, look went to uh, into its website, I, I would I would imagine so, but I, I can't speak to that. Uh, I'm sorry. So may I ask a question? What the the key that you showed us? What what is the purpose of it again? I know it's a security device, but. I have a Mac and I don't have the USB drive on my 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 Mac um, laptop. So if I'm I'm traveling right. with that, you know, what can I use? They make they have other other types of um, UV that company. That's just one company. I mean, it's essentially it's called a security key, and there's other companies that make them as well. And there's different ways that they can transmit to your computer. For example, if you have um, USB-C, or if you have any other sort of port or an adapter, you know, they, they kind of will work with any device. Um, so you could, um, you can, you kind of can match it. And this, like I said, this is, this is a really sophisticated way, but it's, it, it is something that has become, probably will become more and more, um, uh, you know, prevalent um, as, as people become, you know, more systems become more and more um, secure. But I also think that, you know, you're using SMS is as a basics. I mean, I just recommend starting there. If you're not using anything, start with SMS. And then uh, if you are, you know, feel as though, you know, it, you know, at some point you, you learn enough about MFA to move on to something more sophisticated, then that's the time to move to an authenticator app. And then the more advanced thing is 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 something is something I would call it like a security key of some type. May I, may I ask another question? <laughs> Because you got my yeah. book right now. So you, when you're missing the SMS, that's text message. So Google yeah. is automatically sending me a text. Um, yeah. You know, did you log in? Was that you? Mm -hmm. But if we, how can we set up our own for other accounts 
that's probably I don't know if anybody else had that question or were thinking about that because you know we're used to somebody automatically making us do it like the bank or Google. Right. I mean, in, you know, the best thing to do is uh, usually in your account settings in any application there'll be something called account settings. Okay. And if you go to account settings, there's probably something that says privacy or security. And there, that's where you can do things, for example, like change your password. But also, there's, you know, that's how you can check to see if they also enable um, MFA. And it'll say, you know, uh, would you like to enable? Then you, if you enable MFA, those apps will um, then, you know, kind of walk you through the process online in terms of how do you want to do it? What option do you have? And depending on the the you know, sophistication of that particular application will depend on whether or not they allow you to use, use just, just MS, SMS or whether or not they also allow you to use authenticator apps or even better uh, if they allow you to use security. But not like not all systems you know are there yet with that. Okay, now I get it. We have to turn it on. Yes, yes. I mean, awesome. unless. Some companies, some companies mandate it, you know, and like, you know, I mean, some companies are saying, you know, no, you need to do it. And, and you know, that's more and more becoming prevalent. We, at TechSoup, we, we, we you know, have our, you know, our staff have to do it. They don't have a choice in terms of their um, M365 accounts. Um, so I'm going to move on in the interest of time. Um, password management. Um, Oh, look at that. Okay, great. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so password management, this is, you know, this is pretty, you know, basic stuff, but it's really actually one of the most important things because um, we're still using passwords in today's world. Uh, they haven't figured out a way around that yet. I mean, I, one day maybe they'll, uh, they'll figure out how to make, you know, a passwordless world. Or, um, but it, it's complex because and the more and more systems you use online, the more and more passwords you use. And a lot of people will use the same email combination and password, you know, for everything. And then, and it becomes stale. And like I said, if, if you use 20 different apps a day and you're entering your, that same username and password 20 times, it just increases the chance of that exact combination of username and password um, getting, um, getting stolen. And because one of the, at some point, one of those systems is going to get breached. They're going to get your username. They might actually get your password too. Um, so, you know, it, or, and so the thing is, is that with, with people having to use passwords, change them all the time, um, we recommend, um, number one, to make sure you have a strong password. And oftentimes web browsers these days will actually allow you to automatically generate um, a password. And, you know, so the problem is, is that you can't, it's, it's a random string of characters and you can't memorize it. So you either have to cut and paste it, but that's the problem about that is if you cut and paste it and stick it in a, a notepad or, or, or a, something on your computer, like a text application, you know, if your computer gets hacked, then they've got access to all your passwords. So what we recommend is to use a password manager. So what a password manager does is it stores them all in a safe place online. And there's many different, uh, you know, companies that have password managers. Um, we, we don't, like, you know, we think people should, you know, find the one that fits with them. And, and we don't really in these webinars like to endorse particular uh, companies. This is about education. And so, you know, it's, um, what, what is important, though, is, is to employ the practice of using a password manager and also using strong, uh, detailed passwords. If you have to make one up, you know, yourself and not use, you know, a randomly generated string of characters, um, then make sure it's complex and that it combines, uh, you know, characters, you know, special characters, numbers, words, letters, and, um, and you can be in inventive. It's just a way to create a mnemonic about how to memorize that so you don't have to write it down. Um, the, the worst case scenario is that, you know, you write it down on a sticky note and put it on your computer. <laughs> that defeats the whole purpose. Anybody walking by your computer can see, can see that sticky pad and, um, and, and then break in. Um, and so it's, you know, these are the, these are some, you know, some basic things, but they're super,
super important. And then refreshing your password at a minimum every three months. Um, and so that's why it's you know really hard. The password managers make it a lot more easy in today's modern world to manage these things. So you know you look at password manager, um, they're all like you can look at the reviews. They're all pretty. They wouldn't be in business if they weren't good. I mean that's their job, right? So um, is uh, it is to do that. So uh, anyway, so. You know, that's where, you know, it's important about, um, as I mentioned, you know, the, you know, what we see, and there's websites that you can go to and actually look to see if your uh, password has been breached. If you, and I think Google actually provides that now as a service, and some other companies provide that as a service. Uh, and uh, You've Been Pawned is one of them. Um, and uh, and it's a database. People create databases and then they sell these, this information on the dark web. Um, and then they, uh, and then they, people get access. It's public information when, when, when this, this stuff is breached. And so uh, it's, it's, like I said, it's kind of scary, but it's important to know these things so that you could then, you know, understand why we, you know, why we you know, want to educate our community on, on these sorts of practices. So, any questions about password management? I have a question. If no one else has a question, yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead. Please, yes, please. Yes, I have. Um, I see you have popular password managers examples. Uh, can you select that so we can see what those examples are of the uh, popular password managers? You know what? This, this. I'm sorry. This, this, this will be provided. This, this, this uh, will be provided here, and. Um, so, uh, you know, there, you know, I could just say that there's like, you know, if you type them in, um, yeah, thank you. If, you know, if the community wants to share those, with that, that'd be great. Um, just because we're, um, oh, yeah, thank you. And, and actually somebody, somebody put in the have, have, have I been pawned website that that's what I was referring to, to earlier. I love these discussions because I like when people mm -hmm. actually share and add to my dialogue. So, um, so this is great. Um, what are the chances of a password manager getting hacked? It seems like it would be something that would be a problem. I tell you, the people who manage these these password, uh, they are have very interesting ways that they protect their cybersecurity. Um, and they, for example, will have um, multi-layered sort of approaches to their systems. They, you know, because it's their business, it's the focus of their business, and so. Uh, they spend more time and money on on ensuring, you know, everything's about time and money. And so if that's your business, uh, you know, that then, and they are a target and they know they're a target. And so as a result, they're, they have a huge uh, security operations team that do nothing all day long, but to see if who's, who's knocking on their door. And they, and, and they have multiple safeguards in place, uh, you know, they, they ensure that any data that's there is seen only by the people and can only be seen by the people who have special access to that to that data. Like nobody inside their company has access to that information. So, if if nobody inside that company has access to that to your information and your data, then there's you know the only person who could get it is you. You're the one who you know could only compromise the data that would be necessary to then get into that password manager. I hope that makes sense. Um, any other questions? Oh, thank you. Uh, appreciate that. Awesome. Um, yeah, but I think that, you know, one of the things that helps, and this, I will bring this up because I think I saw somebody uh, made reference to it, is one of the things that, uh, you know, it's even though it's a little bit off talk, but it's related to this, is when you're in a public setting, like, you know, at the coffee shop, um, and you're using public Wi-Fi, if, you know, one of the things about using public Wi-Fi is that it's great, it's free. Um, however, you're sharing the network with with strangers, and and it's not it's not necessarily a secure network, or you can't you can't you know you don't know what the efficacy is of that. So I would um, I would I would encourage like you know people to use a VPN when they're in public settings, and that's that that's a a great policy, and and uh, there was a link up there earlier about getting uh, 
VPN. And, and so what that does is that encrypts the data so that somebody, you know, if they, they saw you on your on the same network and they tried that, they had some sophisticated tool to hack your, you know, you know, it, into your computer, they they could because they would, you know, it would it would it's not a, not encrypted. It's it's you know probably it could be uh, just what we call pretext, and so they can intercept your your data and your passwords as you as you enter passwords and go online. Um, does TechSoup offer VPN service? Now that's a good question. Um, if there's anybody from TechSoup on the call that could answer that, that would be great. In my role at TechSoup, I, uh, I manage our internal, our, our, our VPN, but not so much our product catalog offerings as much. I think there might be somebody who's more up to date with that stuff. On hey, Michael not Gale not. here. How are you doing? Hey, Gail. Good. I, Good to see I, you. I have been working and on chat, I just put a whole bunch of information about uh, Dashlane, which in the U.S. Great. is our, our clear uh, provider of uh, password creation, curation, and they have a really robust VPN service. You know, it's one of those great ones great. where you can go, I'm in England, I'm in Uzbekistan, Ube whatever. Yeah. And so you, you can uh, use that as an automated service. And they add new layers to this. And right now we're in the middle of our own um, Cyber Week kind of promotion for them. So through, um, let me take a look real fast here. It's uh, from the 17th through the 28th, you also save on the admin fee. And it is one of those things where uh, if you don't have password management, yeah, you know, to, to Michael's point, you really need it. And in my role of chief business development officer here at TechSoup, uh, I've been trolling for this kind of stuff. And so uh, if anybody has suggestions on other resources you'd like to see or that you really uh, wish were here, uh, I've also included a link to the technology wish list. Feel free to let me right. know and I'll, I'll add it to the list. So, Michael, I'll let you get back to your presentation. Michael, yeah, before, permission. So sorry, before, so let, before I let yeah, this thank, one go, thank. Gail, um, sorry, uh, we have other VPN and uh, offerings on the catalog as well, which are part of the promotion and the Norton 360 is another one of them. Um, it's a new product we have brought to the catalog. It has a VPN, password manager, firewall, and all the other plus uh, endpoint security, all the other things that uh, Michael is going to hit in this presentation. Majority of our uh, security offerings are going to be on a 50% discount for this week and next week. So if you can go check them on our website, we appreciate it. You know, that's great. Thank you so much, Anison, to uh, come in, you know, uh, coming online. Uh, you know, we're really glad to uh, have uh, the folks with those, you know, who do that work at TechSoup on the call with me. Um, and uh, so, you know, thank you so much. And uh, I'll go ahead and, and, and move on. We've got a couple more topics. Um, this is critical. Uh, keeping the software up to date. Um, it, I'd say not nine out of ten times, you know, the reason why a, you know an incident happens that's cyber related is because a system had a known vulnerability that there's known information about how to exploit. So, in the in the cybersecurity language, we call them, you know, uh, essentially. CVEs, which are which are essentially known vulnerabilities, and so after software has been up and running for a while, you know, at some point there's some mistake that's been found in the code, and and what people are constantly doing is trying to see if they can break things, and this is you know, and and then they'll find some you know small crack in the code, and you know, and then try to see what what they, kind of damage they could do, and this is happens constantly by security researchers. There's people who make a living doing this, um, and what they do is they actually, this is something that um, they're called security research, researchers, and they make an, a living independently, and what they do is they, and there's programs that, you know, these Microsoft has these programs, Google has these programs where if you find a security bug, they'll pay you, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it's big business, um, and, and this is how people, uh, you know, find it, and then they find, because it, it helps then it's kind of like outsourcing their their application security, you know, to the community. And so there's white hackers. We call them white hackers, 
And what they do is they constantly look for, you know, you know, you know, mistakes that have been made, not mistakes that remain code, but things that have um, happened. And so that's why we get these, that's why Microsoft has patch Tuesday that happens, um, you know, because, you know, you know, they still have, you know, downloaded software and, and so, you know, like their Windows operating system and such, not everything's in the cloud. And so, you know, things that are in the cloud are oftentimes updated automatically. That's why you get the alerts from like on Zoom, you know, when you use Zoom, it says, oh, you know, make, you know, updating software. It's not just for features, but it's to address uh, security gaps. Um, and, and, you know, likewise, your, your browser um, is, is the target because, you know, your information as you type in your password, it's sort of happening through your browser. And so people have figured out a way to, you know, crack, crack that, uh, you know, that code and to see if they can, you know, hack into your browser. Um, and and then see what kind of what we call cache, meaning stored information is in your in your in your browser's uh, system memory, and people are trying to get access to that because that will contain your passwords. And so keeping your systems up to date is critical. And um, so when you get reminders to update your systems, um, it's important to, to take the time to update the systems. And if you have a company that has um, you know systems that are you know, need manual updating, then your organization should have a policy to, you know, and security patching policy. Um, as as everybody from TechSoup knows, uh, we, you know, have, I think monthly, you know, we have every single month we do patching on our systems. And so we have a patching process we follow and where we go to our different environments and our different systems. And then we send alerts out to the staff saying, look, you know, was, you know, the, you know we're going to have the system's going to be down for a few hours as we go through this very, very important security patching. And it's, it's a, you know, it's a, I guess, a, you know, it's the better, a, you know, even though it's, it's not great that there's business disruption, it's better than the alternative. And so, and taking the time out of your, out of your work and to, you know, and ensuring that you have uh, your systems up to date is, you know, really super critical. Um, and that's, you know, the, and it's not just because there's a bug in the system. It's, it's that, you know, the, uh, sometimes it's because what will happen is, is that the, um, there'll be, you know, as features get out of date, the libraries change. So the thing, this, the, the underlying code gets updated. Even if the code was perfect, at some point, the code that they use to develop the application, um, is older and people, even though it was perfect at the time, it's not perfect anymore. So, uh, you know, and you know, what's really, I th thank you Anison for pointing this out, but using a patch management tool can really help in this process because what it can do is it can collect the assets of an organization. So with TechSoup, what we do is we have a, um, a patch management system. It's sort of an enterprise level one and it goes and it does, it collects all the inventory of all our systems and says, hey, these systems are out of date. Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, because we're a large, you know, enterprise company, we have some very sophisticated tooling, but there's stuff that's, you know, at, for every different size organization, there's, there's patch management uh, tools that can be used. What's great about them is that it does a work of finding out on your network, what things are out of date. And then you could, if you have a, if it's an enterprise type of tool, you could you could update everything at one time. All everybody, you don't have to kill, call people up on the phone or you send an email saying, "Look, will you update your system? It's out of date." It happens automatically, and so um, we we run that on our on our on our you know client machines. They're it, it, you know their uh, antivirus gets updated, um, and we ensure that, and we do an inventory to make sure that's happening. So in the interest of time, we have one more topic, um, and so I want to move on. And then we'll have some questions at the end. Because I, I didn't want to uh, breeze over this, this topic. This is, I think, the most of all the other things. I mean, you could have, because everything we talked about before is kind of related to security awareness training. Um, but this is, it, you know, this is often, when we talk about security awareness training, oftentimes what it is, is essentially being able to recognize if there's a, uh, you know, if you, in an email that there's some sort of uh, something, specific, if you get a suspicious email, there's going to be a link in it. And if you click on that link, it's actually going to do something actionable. It's like you've acted on something. And that could then 
create a whole cascading effect of harm to your systems, to your organization's systems. And this is probably, this is the most common way that security incidents happens through a phishing scam. And uh, in the last, you know, at, you know, as the years, in the last, most recent years, uh, the people who, who do these scams have gotten very, very sophisticated in social engineering. And they've created some very interesting techniques that are, you know, where they go to your, your company's LinkedIn profile and they'll scrape the data, you know, from that and find out who your uh, executive director is, your CFO, or your, uh, you know, um, human resources director. And they'll, what's, they'll impersonate them in an email. So to try to get you to then sort of lure you to do something or to click on a link, you know, um, and sometimes there'll be things like, you know, an email possibly from an executive director saying, hey, you know, I, I need to get them into the bank account today. It's, it's urgent. Is there any information? You know, I, I can't seem to find the username and password for our, our bank account. And, and people, you know, kind of just, you know, in their day-to-day -day stuff, you know, kind of just see it. They see the email. They see, oh, my gosh, you know, this is the, the boss. I got to, like, act on this right away. And then they, and then the second they do that, it's too late. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, you can't really go and undo that except go and say, oh gosh, I better go change the password. Um, so, um, oh, somebody's asked, got a question um, about our new church in the process of building a new website address. This, this is, this is sort of, I don't think we're going to have time to, for me to discuss that in depth because I'd like to understand first. But I think TechSoup has some resources available to, to help with this. So if you can send us a, you know, an email or something or contact us somehow, and maybe, um, Aretha, you could, you could reach out to this organization because we do have some blogs and some other things available to talk about this. Um, and I think that might be some good, um, provide some good information there. So, um, you know, in terms of security awareness training, there's certain tools that are available um, and uh, th that we offer at TechSoup to be able to go in and actually, you know, provide uh, security awareness, awareness training. There's quick videos, videos that provide this. Um, most organizations now have mandatory security awareness training that happens when they're onboarded so that um, we, you know, you actually know that an employee understands, you know, how this, how this works so that, um, you know, they aren't, you know, duped into, a tricky message or, or a, a fake message. But, you know, just the basics of it is that, you know, if, just because it says it's from, you know, somebody important or for some, a company like PayPal, by looking at the actual email address itself, it, if it doesn't say, you know, paypal.com, if it says something like paypal, you know, management.com or paypalbankinginformation.com, then that does, that's not PayPal. <laughs> it's most likely not PayPal. And if you question it, then don't, don't do it. You know, if you, if you get, you know, I mean, the best thing is to, is to be, to, to warn on the safe side and then, and then try to, you know, essentially send it to somebody in your IT department and say, look, I think there's been, you know, uh, I think I, I received this phishing email. Can you verify that it, it's, it's, if it's a real email or not? Always ask somebody in your organization who could validate it or the person who you think is sending you the message. You know, if you think that, you know, if you get something from PayPal or something, don't just click on the link, go to, go to the actual application and, you know, go to the website and then look to see if there's a notification there. That way you know whether or not, because if they're sending you an email, there's going to be information on your, on your account online about whatever they're sending you information about, you know, so, you know, but don't click on the link if it's from, you know, something like a financial institution. Um, and so the, anyway, so I want to leave a little bit of time. So are there any um, questions that, that we, we, can, we can discuss regarding the, the presentation today? And you guys have been a great audience. Uh, really appreciate the, the participation and the discussion and, and the helpful links and, and the sharing of ideas in the, in the chat. That's a super, this is why we love to do these things. Yeah. Feel free to unmute yourself. Michael, this was excellent. Excellent.
Um, feel free to unmute yourself to ask Michael a question directly. I see your um, your hand is raised or there's something. Is it Timis Jen? I can't pronounce your name. I'm sorry. Go ahead and unmute yourself. She's doing it from her phone, so she's trying to unmute her phone. While she's doing that, anybody else have a question? Um, no, this is Mariela. I just wanted to say thank you very much for all the information. I grab very good pointers and ideas to implement. I am in Connecticut and I'll be um, contacting TechSoup very soon. Thank you very much for all the info. Thank you. For You're saying. welcome. So there's a question from Vicky. How do you discern if a prompt to update is authentic? Very good question. It, it, that's, a, that's a really good question. It, um, you know, I, and I, whenever I see one of those, I sort of have to kind of say, well, it, is this, you know, coming in, it, there should be, uh, you know, because it's, you know, there's user account controls, you know, on, on your computer. Um, if you're, you know, if you were to, if you question it, then you can go to the actual website and say, you know, is there, you know, what, what is the latest version, you know, that's available. And so if it matches the version that they're asking you to upgrade to, then it's, then it's, it's going to be safe. Um, so, for example, if you get something that says, you know, Chrome wants to update to version 5.6, you can just go to Google and say recent, you know, Chrome update, and then it'll, it'll let you know that that's what's happening. Um, it is it is good to to validate that. I had a prompt this morning asking me to remove an older Java library off my computer, and so I checked, and it's like, sure enough, it was an older version. <laughs> so I went ahead and felt safe enough doing it. Um, so it, that's a really, really good question, but that's that would, that would be my advice. Right, and Michelle, I see your hand raised, and then Tabitha, I'm gonna read your question. Go ahead, Michelle. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, and you may have said it already, but like for those of us that have employees and other volunteers, um, how often should um, we ask them to change their passwords? Like what policy should we have on how often they should change them? Yeah. The, the general guide, the guidelines on that is is at least every three months. Every three months, okay. On everything, email included. Yeah, everything. Okay, thank you. Okay, I I I got you, Tabitha. But I see Tim. I'm not. I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name right, but Ash. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Okay, my question is that nowadays, you know, we all have many, many, many passwords from work, personal, all that, all that. How can we minimize with all these many webs, I mean, uh, passwords and keep updating them, changing them? It's becoming so difficult. Any idea? Yeah, so earlier in the, in the, in the presentation, we talked about uh, password managers. And um, I think Gail mentioned Dashlane. There's, you know, some other ones that we, you know, we employ, but a password management function, there's, you know, FreePass, LastPass, um, and, you know, I think that it's, you know, there's, that's, that's why people, uh, you know, invented this, these, these, and actually build companies, and some are, and all of them, like I said earlier, are, you know, have very, very strong uh, security compliance, because that, that's their job, you know, is, is to, to do that and it does make life a lot easier um and so that's why we recommend that so uh, password manager password uh, sorry one more is kaspersky legit do they have uh password management tool is it I, I don't know but i don't you know i haven't heard sort of that but you know i don't know everything and every company that produces everything i would say you know uh that you know okay. uh, there might be better guidance in terms of you know which tool to use um, by doing and I and I suggest you know that you look up sort of the ratings and also the you know what is reviews on things. Um, somebody's providing some good uh, recommendations down below. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Last question from Tabitha. She said, "Do you have any advice for a small?" Um, operation, a two-person operation on keeping up with all of this, maybe in order of importance for what you discuss. I don't know how you're going to do this, Michael, but you got it. You know, the, you know the, I think that 
you know, with there's, I think there's a blog 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 article that's coming out at TechSoup um, that I just wrote um, that actually is like something that has four some four simple ways to keep your organization safe. Um, and I go through some basic points. And so keep an eye out for that blog article because I think that it does sort of try to prioritize things um, in terms of the things that an organization should focus on. I mean, and you know, and, and that's distilled down to um, you know the, the the essentials, so to speak. And so. Um, that's super um, is there a book that I could recommend you know because of the um, you know the you know this, this stuff changes so quickly um, at the at the end of uh, you know I think that uh, one thing that would be good to do is to um, go to NIST and NIST which is that reference that I did earlier that uh, NIST and there's a, you know there's it, the information is in this um, uh, in this in this presentation NIST will yeah thank you NIST will have essentially recommendations around you know you know and, and it's, it's it's really pretty straightforward it's not complicated uh, it's it's in good you know easy language and so it's 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 sort of you, know, you don't have to be technical, I guess what I'm trying to say, in order to understand it. So for small organizations that may not have technical staff, at least, you know, it, it kind of breaks it down in some very easy ways, and it's, and they keep that up to date. And so um, I would recommend online resources over, you know, a book on cybersecurity because it changes so often. A book was written six months ago, it might be out of date. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Michael. Excellent. As always, I do want to remind everybody we have uh, the Future of Work conference coming up. It's free to register. There's a link in the chat room. Thank you for your questions. I learned a lot from you and everybody, as you're taking care of everybody else, please make sure you stay safe and take care of yourself. Bye-bye, everybody.